Welcome back, coaches, to Kingdom Coaching, Bible Study, the Book of James. It's been a while since I've seen you guys, and, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to get back with you to study the Book of James. We went through the first three chapters, coaches, and, um, you know, I, I just wanted to show you something. I want to show you my Bible here. I've gone through James so many times that the Bible's ripped. It's kind of getting torn up, and uh, I don't take care of my Bible very well. I don't know how many of you coaches do as well, but I, I don't do as good a job. I almost feel like I need to buy a new Bible. I need some clean space to write on. But nevertheless, we want to go through the first three chapters. And, and Coach, I, I, I really i uh, am looking forward to recharging us again uh, through the book of James. God in his word is great. What is book of James about? It's about maturity. That's the goal. That's the final Ultimate goal for the for the uh, for the book, James, the stepbrother, the half brother of Jesus, uh, had that in mind, full maturity in Christ. And coach, I know you guys can relate to that because you have a football team or a basketball team or a track team, whatever it is that you're coaching, and you're looking for maturity in your athletes. You don't want them like this the rest of their life. You want them to pull the thumb out of their mouth and grow up and do some, do some bloody living out there in the athletic arena. And, and, and when you have mature athletes like that, you give yourself the best chance to maximize your potential, which gives you the best chance to win. And that is true in the kingdom of God. God is looking for wins, wins for his kingdom and King Jesus and his definition of what a win is. And it only comes through maturity. You can't stay a suckling all your life spiritually. We have to grow up. That's what this book is about. And so we want to just kind of hit some points and review the first three chapters. Um, first of all, what is the goal? What is the goal for the Christian? To be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So that through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, Christ is formed through us. Romans 8, 28, for example, says, All things work together for good, those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. And verse 29 talks about what that is. And that is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So that the purpose of James is to identify our need and expose our need for Jesus Christ. To inspire people to rise above this mediocrity that so often happens in the Christian life. So to capture the coach's you coaches desire for, for spiritual maturity, which means as you go through chapter one, you, you look at verse two, for example, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall through various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have its full work, that you may be complete and entire, lacking in nothing. So this book is about being victorious in suffering. This first portion of the book, victorious in suffering. God uses the crucible of trial, suffering. Let's talk about our language in the coaching world. Losses, losses uh, in games. Um, uh, our best players going down with injuries. Media criticism, fans booing, uh, getting fired from your job. All those things are suffering. Sometimes even when you're winning a lot of games, there's things going on in the community, things going on on that team that are disrupting you. It's trying your faith. And God says you need to learn how to grow through that and be mature by using those trials to accelerate your maturity. And so is your faith vital and useful in the midst of trial? And so the Bible says that uh, after verse 4, if you lack wisdom, if you need specific wisdom, ask God, he will give it to you. He won't hold it against you. A double-minded man, though, is unstable in all his ways. God does not want us, as it says in verse 8, chapter 1, he doesn't want us to be double-minded. He wants us to be single-minded. He wants to know, us to know our goal. He doesn't want us shifting our goal from, you know, oh, I'm going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, I'm going to live out Christ. And then the moment circumstances are not favorable to us, we resort back to the flesh and to the kingdom of this world. No, no, that, that's not what God wants. He wants a consistency. And so he redefines success for us. If you look at uh, verse 9, he says, The brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, whereas uh, 
the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like a flowering grass, he will pass away. So what God is saying is that, look, on this earth, it looks like the person who's living in humble circumstances doesn't have much, isn't considered very much. Some of the best uh, uh, um, situations that we see, of course, is a lot of these kids come from humble backgrounds. And it, it, they don't look like maybe they could make much of themselves. They don't seem to be very important. God doesn't want you defining success like that. So he says, exalt when you don't have much in the high position that God wants to give you through that humility. And then he's trying to tell the people who are rich in this world, people who seem to have a lot, tons of talent, tons of ability, tons of money, they've won a lot of games. He's saying, hey, you're going to be like a, a flower that just kind of burns away. You're going to fade away. You're going to get burnt and, 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 and disappear after a while. And so in the game of football, I know from, from coaching, at some point, you, you, after all this success, you begin to see that it doesn't last. And it begins to kind of melt away from you. And he's saying, hey, you ought to be happy with that. Because now you've just had your need for me exposed. And then it goes on to say, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life. Well, you know what? We don't get to see all the crowns on this earth. We're, we're taught to have an appetite for Jesus. How do you get an appetite for Christ? You get an appetite for Christ by not living for something that's temporary. How do you? How do? How do you? How does a football uh, coach get a player to be excited and to be and to be energetic through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday workouts in the weight room, out on the field, practice? Sometimes we have a hard time getting those guys going. What's the difference between an athlete who has great hunger and an athlete who just seems to kind of just be lackadaisical? early in the week. The difference is, is that athlete who has great hunger is seeing Saturday. And that athlete who is just kind of, you know, going through the mundane, the challenges, not excited early in the week, he can't see that far ahead. He can't see Saturday. But that's true of you and I spiritually. Coach, why are some of us so lethargic? In fact, why are most of us? Let's just be honest. In America, in this land, even though we have pretty much a fair amount of free expression for our faith in Jesus Christ, we still get to go to churches on Sunday, we have Bible studies during the week, we have Bible apps all over the place, we have radio shows, we have podcasts, and it's all kinds of opportunities to hear the gospel. We have Bibles everywhere. But guess what? We're kind of lethargic. We, we, we settle for mediocrity. We're not really excited. You know why? Because we're not looking to what's ahead. We're not looking to our glorious future. So we don't have much energy for the things of God. Where do you stand with that? Where do I stand with that? If that's the case, man, we better really take heed to the book of James. Because it's not going to fly with God. God does not want double-minded people. He wants those who know Christ as their Savior and Lord, to live vibrant, useful lives for Christ. That means you have to have an appetite. You've got to be able to read the Word of God, go live the Word of God, get hungry, read the Word of God again, live it, read, live it, read, live it. That's what we're called to do. That's what this book is about. Do you have an appetite? If you don't have an appetite for Christ, something's wrong. And so, perhaps you... As you think about it, let's just break this down a little bit to help you think about where you're at right now because James wants you to understand that as we move into that second chapter. Are, are you one who's got a seed that went planted into the ground according to the parable that Jesus talked about in, in, in a couple of his Gospels? And, you're, and, the, and the birds came and stole that seed. Gone. You're not even interested. You have no desire at all for spiritual matters. You're probably not even listening <laughs> to this if that's where you're at. Uh, maybe you fall into a second category. Well, the seed gets into the ground, but it lands on rocky soil, and it has no root. It doesn't ever take root. You just never really just seems to even make any kind of sense at all to you, and you don't grow. The, the third seed is the one who gets roots. It kind of 
boom, it springs up fast, got all excited, got all emotional. Man, I had a, had a time with Jesus Christ. Maybe you came forward at a church. Maybe you raised your hand at the response of a pastor. And then you just kind of die because you're entangled with this world. You're so concerned about the riches of this world. You're just constantly tossed and entangled in, in how you look to everyone else and you can't take any kind of trial or difficulty. And you just kind of, it just doesn't seem to click. Or maybe you're that fourth seed that it's landed in great soil. And man, you are growing 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And you understand what it means to be f filled with the Spirit of God. And, and you are hungry and you are excited. I'm not saying you're perfect. None of us are perfect. Sometimes we sin and we mess up, but you're quick to repent, confess, and receive the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where do you stand, Coach? So, moving on, chapter 2. It says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Do you live out of prejudice? You know, a lot of us grew up in a, a very divided type situations. Um, maybe it's uh, the p part of the country that you lived in. Maybe in your town, it could have been a small town, you develop certain attitudes towards certain people. Maybe you grew up in a large city and certain parts of the city, there were different types of people living there in, in the demographics of that city, you know, socioeconomic status, skin color, uh, you name it, and you've kind of, uh, maybe you've grown up in situations just from maybe a fairly, what you thought was a very normal childhood, but you were allowed slowly but surely to develop certain types of attitudes towards certain types of people. And, and what God is saying here is that you got to, you got to put all that stuff down. It's not about your personal feelings or preferences anymore. It's about the preferences of the Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus, Him only. And what we need to become now in the kingdom of God is really like a home plate empire, so to speak. We're able to look at someone's character. We're able to look at someone's life and see it for what it really is. You want a home plate empire that's not making calls based on his feelings. You want a home plate empire to be making calls of ball and strike based on the accuracy of what they're saying. Ball, strike. Ball, strike. That's a trusted empire. That's what we're called to be. We have the mind of Christ, those of us who know Jesus Christ. We should not be picking out personal favoritism based on the kinds of divisions that we see so often in this world. So, the Lord, through, through James, really asked his people, you coach, to don't make distinctions, worldly distinctions. Make distinctions that are based on where people land spiritually. And if you know somebody, coach, and you're, you're a Christian coach, and you have a heart for your players, and you see that there's, there, are, there are players on our team that don't know Jesus Christ as their saving Lord, black, white, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. I'm looking for a way to reach them with the gospel. It's not going to be based on playing time, skin color, socioeconomics. And you're able to extract the precious from the worthless. You're able to really be a good home plate empire and say, this is what this young man needs. Or this is what this young gal needs. She needs this. This is the kind of Jesus love that she needs or he needs. And then the scripture moves on. And it talks about, in the middle of that chapter, chapter 2, it talks about faith and works. It says, what use is it, my brethren? Remember, he's talking to Christians. If someone says he has faith, but he has no works. And so what he's trying to get here is that you, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not trying to define salvation based on your works. Salvation is based on faith, which comes from the grace of God. But the works are evidence. The works are supposed to be evidence of a saved life. So when someone sees you and they see that you have faith in Jesus Christ, there is evidence, it is an integrous amount of evidence that says, yeah, that's, uh, that's what a Christian should look like. Coach, if you're, if you're a solid Christian, if you know Christ is your saving love, you're growing your faith. Your language, your body language as well, 
<laughs> not only your verbal language, but your body language, your gestures, the way you handle officials, the way you talk to your players, the way you respond to a win or a loss, how you recruit if you're a college coach, what you make, what you make as a promise, how you conduct yourself in a moment of sudden surprise, the language that flows out of your mouth, what you do when no one else is watching should all be consistent with your faith. And that's what maturity is, is when your behavior and your words, as we get into it, we're going to be talking about the tongue in chapter 3, your, 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 your behavior and your words begin to match your faith. That's what it means to grow and become more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So it is true. What you see is what you get with that coach. You don't want to be a person who keeps people guessing all the time. Who are you really, with your friends, without your friends, when you're in public, when you're private? Chapter 3, finally, uh, the last chapter that we ended with uh, a while ago. It says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that such as we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bride his whole bridle his whole body as well. So what, what uh, James is teaching us is that, look, you have a response. Boy, if you're a teacher, if you're a coach, if you're in a leadership position, guess what? You're going to have to use words. It, you're not going to just be living by action only. There's going to be things that come out of your mouth based on the paradigm of how you live. And eventually, what's in there is eventually going to come out. And so, coach, if you are one who is not stumbling in what you say, what comes out of your tongue, man, that's a real mark of maturity. But if what comes out of your mouth is very inconsistent with this word of God, something's drastically wrong. And as we look down through it, we realize that this tongue, although it's little, it's like the bit that kind of directs a horse. Thousands of pounds of uh, muscle <laughs> this, this horse has. And this bit is able to control the horse wherever it wants to go. That's exactly what our tongue does. That little tiny thing in our, in our mouth, the tongue, is able to speak words and direct this body to wherever it desires to go. And it can, it can ruin a culture or it can bless one. And that's what James is trying to get us to understand is that we have to be able to pilot that tongue. And it, it, it's got to be fed by God's word and the Holy Spirit as we study God's word. And so we, he goes on to say this as you get further down the chapter, and he talks about integrity. Because what does integrity mean? Integrity means that you're taking two things and they become together as one. So you've got two entities. You've got, you've got God and you've got man. And when Christ unites us, okay, so God and man are now united through Christ. Now we get to live this, what we call, this oneness life, this singular life. That's what the word integrity means, integer. It means a whole number one, which cannot be divided. And we're, we're called not to be hypocrites and live two different lives. So the analogies, he, as we get down in the middle of, of chapter 3, if you look at verse 11, he says, there's a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water. Can a fig tree, my brethren, my brethren, talking to Christians, can a fig tree produce olives or does a vine produce figs? Nor, nor can salt water produce fresh water. So what he's saying here is that, look, what you see has got to be what you get. You can, if you're truly a Christian, if you're truly living out your faith in Jesus Christ and you're growing in maturity, it's going to produce a mature Christian paradigm. It's going, to, it's going to then flow out of your mouth and flow out of your life in one singular, integrous way. So coach, when people look at you, they see the reality of Jesus Christ. And then you always have access, just like we all do, as a Christian, to 
Understand that God's wisdom is perfect from above. It's not demonic. It's not earthly. It's not divisive. It's without hypocrisy. Now, we kind of just kind of blitz through this a little bit. Uh, but just some key verses in the scripture we went over just to remind you of where we're at. Remember, as we go back, this is about maturity. In fact, the very first line that James uses um, in, the, in the book of James is a reminder that, listen, in the midst of this church, and back in the day when this book was written, James was talking to a dispersed church, a church that was running because of persecution. And he was trying to encourage them, and he was saying, listen, remember, you're still a bond slave of Jesus Christ. You are called to be obedient to him. And just because you're going through hard times, understand that God is in control, and he's going to use all of that to make you a mature man and woman in Jesus Christ. So again, the objective of James is for you to reach the goal of being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, which means maturity in Christ. And the context of this maturing process is through trials, a persecuted church. And so, coach, you live in a chaotic environment. If you're coaching, I know you do. And God is going to use trials in your life to help you build the maturity that you need to be a great ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ as you're on display with fruits that come inside out in an integrous form for your players to look at, your community to look at, and say, ah, that's what Jesus Christ looks like through a, through a, a life that's committed to him. We're looking forward to getting to James chapter 4. I want you to dive in. And uh, let me just pray our way out of this. Father God, we just thank you for this word. We love you. We just pray that uh, you would use your word to inspire us to live out the reality of Jesus Christ through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit by the way we coach. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining me this week. Looking forward for James 4 the next time.